Hello, friends. Welcome to uh, this History News Live. I am seeing the comments. I'm just going to flag something very quickly. There is no History After Dark tonight. That was a mistake in the scheduled content. We are going to be doing History After Dark, as per usual, on Wednesday, where you have, if you are following over there, you will have seen that it has been scheduled. And uh, the topic for our Deceased Gits series, we are at number V, letter V. <laughs> Uh, and we aren't doing Victoria, we're doing her mummy. So um, buckle up for Wednesday, it's going to be a wild ride. So we aren't we aren't on History After Dark, we are, I'm here, hello, thank you. Let's get into saying some hellos, it's lovely to see people here. Elaine of Shalott, I'm assuming as well, considering the surname, that you are also Adventures from Shalott, and you are also going to be featured in the thank you. So hello, welcome. Some conversation about the history after dark. Apologies for the confusion. Thank you for making your way back over here, Hadrian, and uh, for, for sounding the alarm because I saw that, went and checked, and swiftly contacted Philip and Catherine and went, Ladies, <laughs> have you abandoned me? And I didn't know about it. Have you decided that I'm not one of you anymore? Um, and uh, yes, it. It did, <laughs> at that point, swiftly get updated because they've not left me out. They are still my friends, so that's nice. Hello, and uh, Lisa, I suppose it's a question at this point. If uh, it's 4.30 a.m. where you are, good morning. Uh, there's, a, there's a question of, with that little sleep to be had, <laughs> is, is, the, is the cure worse than the sickness? Well, um, I... Thank you for joining. If you do have a nap, I totally understand. Don't worry. Don't worry at all. Yes, that is definitely Diana. We are here for we are here for that. We are going to be doing some news reporting. Hello, Shane. Thank you very much. And uh hello to everybody. It's it's <laughs> with all the merge documentaries I watch, they they know better than to kick me out. I mean, you would think, but people get brave. <laughs> right, let me start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Welcome to everybody who is joining live. Thank you so much for taking the time to join. And if you are watching this on a playback, thank you ever so much for taking the time to watch it on the playback. As per usual, we have today some updates, some repatriation slash decolonization news. We have our new news. We have a few ding-dongs. It's been a bit of a time, to be honest. I don't know if it's a full moon or something or other. And then we do have a couple, just a couple of events and exhibitions. I have made an opera pin board. For some reason, it's not letting me share the opera pin board, but never fear, because if you go to the description box, you will see that all of the articles that I have referenced today and will be referenced, referencing today, plus a few others, will be linked down there in a numbered fashion for ease of use. You will notice that the numbers next to the news article correspond with the number beneath the text you're seeing on screen on the bottom of the slide I am showing you. So it should all combine to make it as easy to use as possible. I do, of course, have lots of people to thank. Before we jump into that, I do just want to flag something else. And uh, before I do so, thank you ever so much, Lisa, for the super sticker. That is incredibly kind of you and very generous. Welcome. Thank you. Um, before I jump into the slideshow and the thank yous and then the news. I just want to say, I've seen a couple of comments coming in of people saying, why did you delete my comment? Now, I had no idea. It's happened twice and I have responded to both the ones I've seen. But if I've seen two, then I'm guessing that perhaps more have gone missing. So I don't quite know what's happened. What I will say is this, I don't delete comments. If somebody says something in my comments that I think is beyond the pale, I won't delete their comment. I will block them. So if you are able to comment, continue to comment on my videos and a comment of yours has gone missing, YouTube might have deleted it or hidden it, but I certainly didn't. Because if you can still comment then and I'm responding to you, then I didn't block you, <laughs> which means I didn't delete the comment. And I want to also point out that it is vanishingly rare <laughs> that I will block someone. It has to be a, you know, major infraction and usually because they've been horrible to somebody in our community and I just think do you know what that's enough of that 
The other thing I will say is that my settings for the kind of what YouTube, the algorithm does in terms of comments, it's set to a really high threshold for potential rudeness or abuse. And so it's possible that some a word that you put in, I'm sure it wasn't intended to be rude, that a word that you put in may have flagged in the YouTube algorithm and it might have deleted the comment, but it's not me. I, I didn't do it. And I also haven't got anybody else going through my comments and deleting it. I do have my husband in the lives occasionally, um, but he also doesn't delete comments. So I don't know what to tell you. If you do see comments going missing, um, but it's, and especially if it was a suggestion for a cool video, I, I would really appreciate it if you could try emailing over to me. And all of my links are in my description box or in my link tree, etc. Odd. Don't know what's happening. But I just wanted to flag that. So, yes. Let's. And Paige, not exactly history related, but the writer's strike might be over. That's very interesting because I just finished editing my video for this Friday, which is looking at the use of chat GPT, which of course is one of the things that was motivating the writer's strike. So maybe it is a nice little coalescence and they've got what they what they deserve. You, YouTube does delete inappropriate comments, but when people have said, why should you delete, one of the comments that I saw today, someone said, why should you delete my comment? And they repeated it and so it stayed and it wasn't inappropriate. So I, I have no idea. Not a clue what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it could be certain words. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Hadrian, you could, it, indeed, YouTube does work in mysterious ways. I do sometimes think that if you went to, like, the proper YouTube main office, there'd just be a very big green curtain um, <laughs> and a little man with a very big screen um, and a big head and probably a hot air balloon. In my mind, it's the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's the red Wizard of Oz in my mind. Uh, let's also, um, I've, I mean, clearly you've allowed, been allowed to comment that, but let's not test in the comment section because if too many people do start putting rudery in there to see what it will flag, then uh, they might just block the channel. So let's let's not play with the YouTube algorithm, shall we? Um, I well. Somewhat. Let's jump in. Let's start with some thank you, shall we? Lovely. So I need to thank Adventures from Shalott. I need to thank Yvonne, Anne, Name Twin Cat, Carve Felum, Lana, Joseph, Elverta, Jesse, Mary, Ellie, Melissa, Sarah, Linda. Pretty Pick, Carolyn, Crazy Artist Lady, Kathy, Beth, Laura, Barbara, Catherine, Alicia, and Canet8966. Thank you ever so much for all of the time that you all take to send me the articles you find. It really does mean ever so much, and it makes this whole process so much easier. With no more further ado, let us hop into the updates. First up, this relates to that TikTok video of the teapot turning into the girl and trying to escape the British Museum. So this is an update on that. And this is the teapot in question. So we and as we see, it's decorated with a pattern of lotus flowers. But this is a teapot that dates to 2011. So it's a really interesting article, and I think, and I, I, I mean, I wonder why this was the item that was chosen, as it is so recent, and and presumably, and according to the provenance, it was in fact gifted by the artist to the British Museum. So in terms of a kind of provenance and contested history, this thing doesn't have it. So I wonder why they chose this when there is, you know, a whole 
bunch of other stolen stuff that they could have picked. So yeah, I'll be quite interested to find out why that's happened. The next update, uh, ha- I when people send me email updates, I or 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 um Twitter, they send me Twitter links. I I get so many of them that I can't respond personally. So what I will do is I will say thank you in these live streams and I will then talk about them. That is my response. But occasionally, and this is the first time, uh, there's been two this week. A news item comes in that that forces a reply. And this is one of them. Ron DeSantis taught history. And when I saw that headline, I was I was befuddled and baffled so apparently and this is this is this article came out uh, a while ago but this is the first i'm seeing of it so i'm going to put in the update according to the story he taught at a georgia boarding school um it was 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 there was that i thought that and then there were some in my brain some expletives that came out i so Apparently, he was also a baseball and football coach, and apparently in this, he was respected by his team. But as a teacher, he was remembered by some former students as cocky and arrogant. He once published, publicly embarrassed a student with a prank, hung out at parties with seniors, and got into debates about the Civil War with students who questioned the focus and sometimes the accuracy of his lesson. So when I read that, I was like, oh no, that sounds about that sounds about right. So he was just he was a history teacher who learned nothing. And from from the process of teaching history, that does not surprise me, because there can be some utterly woeful, particularly um this seems to me, and it may be I'm if I'm wrong on this, this seems to me, as it's a boarding school, I'm assuming private, if it's like England, the UK, then there isn't a requirement for teacher training. And it doesn't seem like he did any teacher training as he was fresh out of Yale when he took the teaching position. So I don't believe he did teacher training as part of his time at Yale, particularly as he was 23. So I'm assuming he just went straight from uni into this school without having any training and clearly he did not he he was only there for a year and uh, he learned nothing from it (laughs) Uh, apart from to be essentially someone who's going to try and um, butcher history it's oh Oh, turn, yeah, he also the truth hugely. Exactly, exactly. Oh, so you would call it um, a certified state teacher. Right, okay. And we just, you know, we call it, you know, teacher training. Because at private schools here, you don't necessarily have to have somebody who's had teacher training. There are different rules apply. Oh, so parents were paying for this. He, he, he's, um, so Yale, he was Yale Law. I'm assuming, and then he was a JAG officer. I don't, I'll be honest; I've heard that, and I've there's a, there's a TV show called JAG, but I don't really know what that is. Is that like a military police? No. Um, so he wasn't a history major. What are these parents paying for? <laughs> that is, nope, no, thank you. So that that's the update on on that. Um. Ah, oh, sorry, that was a judge, advocate, general military lawyers, military law. So when, so it's that kind of you can't handle the truth. It's my, is my <laughs> impression of that. Thank you for the fabulous, fabulous. So we also have. I think this, this is. I've said this before. I'm really interested by this study in to how they are using scent and reconstructing smells to fill in, to add to exhibitions, etc. So they have, they've called it the scent of eternity. And they've not made it sound great here. 
experts have reconstructed the smell of mummified organs. I mean, that's you've buried the lead by then following on with it's actually pretty pleasant because that does not sound pleasant, but apparently it does. I would never have thought mummified organs. Mm, let me smell that. This is we're t- we're talking about notes of beeswax, beeswax, tree resin, and balsam with a hint of tar and some sweetness. That's like the new pour on fragrance, and it's not when it's not being called a perfume or what we would call a perfume today, but it is for this preservation of the body for the afterlife. Old old factory designer, which is such a great job title. Carol Calvis, who's in France, and a sensory museologist, what a fabulous job, Sophia Colette Eirich at Ode Ode Europa, which I've talked about before. I think it's Ode Europa, so it's Oda Europe. This is the European research project that is dedicated to olfactory heritage. I'm going to find a contact for these people. I want to talk some more about it. I think it's really fascinating. They have spent six months trying to reconstruct or recreate the scent of a complex mummification balm for a doctoral dissertation. And this has now been teased out in a study which has been published in scientific reports. So now we can get a nose full of this recipe if you go to Egypt and... The, sorry, if you go to an exhibition on ancient Egypt at the Mosgard Museum in Denmark. So do check that out. And uh, if you are in Denmark and you get a chance to have a sniff of a mummified remains, which doesn't sound nice, uh, but apparently it's supposed to smell lovely. If Tell us what it smells like if you get the chance. Those are the updates. <laughs> I remember very clearly the Old Spice adverts, the man your man can smell like. (laughs) I'm on a horse. This is like the corpse your corpse could smell like. (laughs) There needs to be a parody video for a very niche market. I need an attractive chiselled man in a towel to do this for me. (laughs) Oh. I want, I want to collect them all, like sniff them and and collect them all. Mmm. Mmm. I mean, the Victorians would love it, but they'd be like, please, this, this fragrance does not have nearly enough arsenic in it. <laughs> At once, add some arsenic green. I must. <laughs> well, that's a bonus. That's a bonus for the Victorians. Nobody's eating it this time. Um, yeah, I've heard that the smell at Jorvik is, is, I've heard it mentioned a few times. Oda Midden, that's <laughs> yum, yummy. We're on to, we're on to repatriations now, friends. A seizure of an ancient sculpture at the Cleveland Museum of Arts is being presented as a global shift in the returning of looted or contested artworks. This, we are told, this is Ohio's biggest art museum and it had been gearing up to open on Sunday with a major exhibition which is entitled China's Southern Paradise, Treasures from the Lower Yangtze Delta. The exhibition's message of cultural harmony contrasts with, we are told, another international story about the museum and that is namely the seizure of an important ancient Roman bronze sculpture from the collection by the Antiquities Trafficking Unit of the New York City DA's office. This seizure, we're told, is related to a criminal investigation of looting and trafficking of ancient art at the site of the ancient Roman town of Bubon in southwestern Turkey. They go on to explain that the new climate is evolving almost daily, raising questions about the long-term status of many objects once thought to enjoy stable, permanent status known in the museum business as repose. Objects that are clearly linked to recent criminal activity are more likely than ever to be repatriated. But the new ethos also involves a broader reckoning over artwork seized in wartime or through exercises in colonial power. This is a really long article. I reckon it lays it out really nicely. 
Uh, so I recommend having a look at it. It, it probably isn't going to tell you anything we haven't already discussed, but it is really consolidated down and grouped together in a way that if you have people who in your life who don't really understand what all of the fuss about repatriation is, this could be a useful article. Check it, see what you think. This could be a useful article to send to them and going, here's the issue and here's what's happening. It goes on, no one can say how the movement to right past wrongs will change the world's art museums. Arguments over whether contested artwork should stay where they are or be returned to their modern nation states of origin remain unresolved. Laws, treaties and property rights may not decide such questions. Museum directors and trustees will be forced at times to make tough ethical choices. Quote, it comes down to each leader's moral compass and sense of obligation to considerations that are not purely about the museum's desires, but about the larger picture we all live through. And that's museum expert Maxwell Anderson. Uh, Anderson is a former museum curator who led the Art Gallery of Toronto, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Indianapolis Museum of Art and the Dallas Museum of Art. In 2017, Oxford University Press, OUP, published his book, Antiquities, What Everyone Needs to Know. I think I will be checking that out. Um, back to the perfume thing, Betwixt the Sheets. Obviously, I I do get fairly regular sponsorships with History Hit that runs between the sheets. I also was very privileged to be interviewed by Kate Lister for Betwixt the Sheets to talk to her about trash. And she is genuinely lovely and funny and kind. And everything that she comes across on the podcast, she is she is that person. So I will be checking out the perfume one too. The v &A is going to be looking after some ancient Yemen stones that were found in a London shop. These stele date from the second half of the, of the first millennium BCE, and it's being kept allegedly until it's safe to return. I think this is, other than this is a, I don't think this is a kind of seizure by stealth from the sounds of it. I, I could be wrong, but I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be a positive Pollyanna. And, this v &A, the v &A is going to look after these funerary stones that were found by police in a shop in East London. The v &A is going to care for, research and conserve them on a temporary basis before returning them to Yemen when it's safe to do so. And in the meantime, they're going to be on show as part of a display on culture in crisis at the v &A East storehouse from 2025. So that's going to be in my neck of the woods, v &A East, and it it's a really from the stuff they've talked about. It sounds like a really exciting space. It's opening in a couple of years, and I will be doing all I can to try and get an invite to the launch, <laughs> so I can have a nosy around and tell you what I find. It, this again, we're talking about there being growing demands on institutions in the UK to return looted artifacts. These stones were apparently discovered by an archaeology enthusiast in an interior design shop in East London and then were recovered by the Metropolitan Police's Art and Antiquities Unit, which investigates art theft, illegal trafficking and fraud. This agreement that's been signed between Tristan Hunt and the ambassador for Yemen based in the UK, we are told, is unique. The in most similar cases, the objects are going to be stored by museums for a short time before being transferred to their country of origin. But this agreement does allow for further research and conservation and for the objects to be on public display. And um, these have been determined to be uh, ancient archaeological artefacts from Yemen. The hope is that these objects are going to encourage members of the public to consider antiquities from a legal perspective as well as an aesthetic one. I think, to be honest, that there's a growing conversation that's noisy enough that unless, maybe I'm wrong, but at this point it feels like you'd have to be actively trying not to hear it rather than having, it's not crossed your desk, if you if you will. Charles Harper, who is the UK's deputy ambassador to Yemen, said, quote, arts and culture can play an important role in rebuilding a society from conflict. And this agreement is a fantastic way to ensure Yemeni culture remains in Yemeni care. The war there has taken a devastating toll on Yemenis, 
the UK will continue to support UN-led efforts to bring about a sustainable and inclusive peace in Yemen. The objects are of the type that the International Council of Museums has been placed on the emergency red list of cultural objects at risk. Now, everyone has, whenever I sort of put my stall out, so to speak, about things belonging in their home countries and etc. I the question I get asked is, well, what if there's mass destruction happening because of civil war or invasion or something else? And I believe those things are different, but I also believe that they can be handled in a way that they haven't yet been handled. And this to me, I mean we'll see how it plays out. This to me sounds like an ideal way that these objects are in the temporary custody of a non-conflict ridden nation but they are always going to be returned to their place of origin that is the plan that is always it's almost like foster care but the the and as with foster care the option and the desire is always reunification and i think that's what should be what's happening and so if we're going to have a kind of monuments men and I haven't seen that film, so that might be a really bad way of referencing it. But but a, a team that kind of drop in, get hold of stuff and then get out and keep it safe. But also, as I said before, a way to do it is let's also make sure that the people who take care of these objects in their home institutions come with it. This would be a really great way to keep those people safe, to evacuate them and also to maintain and ensure that the objects themselves maintain the story because it's not just that they aren't just these the people who are in these museums or these sites with these objects they aren't just the custodians of the objects they're the custodians of their provenance their stories but also their myths and and those are just as important for maintaining the identity of these pieces um, and ensuring that they don't become dislodged from that is uh, you wonder how the London shop got hold of them? Well, when I when I saw East London, it wasn't specific, but my thought process was mm, Shoreditch because there's East London and then there's East London, and it sounds like it was in a decor sort of antique antique homewaresy store, and um, probably a few people called caribou walking around is what i'm gonna say so that's it it got there because it's it's probably in a very expensive homeware store it surrounded by pretentious people <laughs> it's what i'm gonna say but i could be wrong about that i'm, I'm potentially making it up the metropolitan museum of art has allegedly secretly sold a $70 million Van Gogh that was looted by the Nazis in an attempt to cover up the fact that they owned a looted piece. This is whew, no bueno. They have been accused of secretly selling this work and the museum is now being sued by a Jewish family who owned this painting called The Olive Picking before World War II and they, they wanted it back. It's thought to be worth $70 million. We are told the painting was bought by the Met in 1956 from Brooke Astor. Now, I know the name Astor, and that's that's big money. The socialite who died at age 105 in 2007. This piece was then sold secretly in 1972, and it then vanished from public view. It then surfaced in 2019 in the catalogue of a newly opened gallery in Greece. Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. It's been pieced together what they think may have happened. And now the heirs of the original owner are suing both the Met and also the Greek Museum's operators. This is the Basil and Elise Gulandris Foundation. And this is not the first time that that name has come up in relation to some shonky ownership because i've heard that name before in relation to repatriation and this weird museum that they have and i don't i don't know enough about the museum but i do know that a way of burying the tax lead is to say that you have a museum that has a very specific guest list of 
you <laughs> and your mates, and then it becomes a tax write-off. So I'm not saying that is what is happening here, but allegedly that is a thing that happens. The Met is apparently fighting the case, saying it had no idea the work was looted. It just secretly sold it because it didn't want to have a loud sale. The nine plaintiffs include the grandchildren and step-grandchildren of the original owner. The case threatens to open the Met's secret files about one of its most story creator. And here we go, what I talked about, the former Monuments Man, Theodore Rousseau. So when I said we wanted to be like the Monuments Men, but I haven't seen the film, I'm now thinking that I should have watched the film because we don't want this to happen. No. So we'll keep an eye and see what happens there, but it doesn't sound very promising. Sounds very naughty. Uh, and apparently the people who are smuggling antiquities are taking <laughs> lessons from criminals in Scooby-Doo because they are stealing Italian treasures under piles of pasta. I'm... <laughs> I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for these pesky pasta-eating kids. Uh, Italian art detectives have found stolen ancient treasures at a leading Australian university. That's going to be awkward, isn't it? Including an artefact that was likely smuggled out of the country under piles of pasta. The Australian National University is working with the special art squad of the Cabinieri to return the priceless pieces. These works were discovered within the university's classics museum and included amongst them is a 2,500 year old amphora that depicts the Greek champion Hercules fighting the mythical Nemean lion. Apparently it's been a key object in the Australian museum's, what's the word? Uh, catalog is the word I'm looking for, for almost 40 years. Police found a Polaroid photo of the vase when investigating an unnamed thief. Apparently, the university had bought the vase in good faith at a Sotheby's auction in 1984, but was now proud to return it to its rightful home. The vase is apparently supposed to date back to 530 BCE. It's a vest with two handles, and it would have been used for storing olive oil or wine. The Cabinary identified a also a stolen red fish plate, and they were able to trace this to David Holland Swingler, who is the American art trafficker and food importer known for a culinary modus operandi. Cheeky. During trips to Italy, he sourced material directly from to Tomboroli, which literally means tomb robbers. It's a really cute word for a really, really offensive act. Tomboroli sounds really benign, doesn't it? So they undertake illegal excavations. Then Swingler smothers, smuggles the items into the US amongst bundles of pasta and other Italian foods. Australia's National University is, being, is saying that it must be at the forefront of best practice in the management and restitution and repatriation cases. Italy's government has agreed to loan the vase and the fish plate to the university until they are returned at a future date. I think this is the, the other thing, is that with this claim for, or this demand for repatriation, in so many cases, what the na nation of origin is looking for is the appropriate reference to their ownership. It's often been said, I've seen it written a lot, that Nigeria doesn't want every Benin bronze back from the British Museum. They don't want all of them. But what they want is for every Benin bronze in the British Museum and any other site that they are currently in or remaining in to reference the fact that it's on loan. And it can be long-term loan, but let's reference the fact of who it belongs to. And some may and will be recalled, as is their right, but not all of them. And here we have long-term loans at a future date. I also have questions, Debbie. Cooked pasta, hard noodles, raw pasta noodles. I, I mean, 
I'm assuming that it must have been like wet pasta. <laughs> wet pasta around the vase would surely be a problem. So it's got to be, and surely not, it must be in some kind of packaging, right? But something that's presumably also going to cushion any blow. I have questions too. I frequently have pasta related questions. That's that's how I live my truth. The uh, Antiques Roadshow got a bit spicy. Apparently they sparked a debate after an expert on the show asked two guests if they planned to repatriate items that were gifted to their grandfather under colonial rule. Two women brought forward items that were given to their grandfather, Sir Harold Kittermaster, who was governor of a country that was then known as British Somaliland. This country then declared independence in 1960. Apparently, Kittermaster formed a friendship with the Emperor of Ethiopia. The pair exchanged letters, and Kittermaster was even invited to his coronation. This, cor this correspondence was presented to the uh, Antiques Roadshow expert, in addition to there being some garments that also once belonged to them. He asked women, what are you, women, and what are you going to do with these things, and if they were considering returning them. The pair replied that this was under discussion with one saying, we're going to have a think about it. The expert said, so if there's a call for these things to be repatriated, would you be happy to do that? Women ag agreed, saying they absolutely and definitely would. But these comments have now been criticised by a leading academic who noted that Ethiopia has not asked for these gifts to be returned. Even if we believe in returning objects, it doesn't qualify because it's an open gift we're told, and it seems to be backed up by the letters. I haven't read the letters. We are dealing with a gift, and so who to whom should it go? A BBC spokesperson told The Independent, "We where we have relevant details about an item, experts explore the wider questions of provenance in relation to a variety of contexts, including the history of British Empire, which in this instance was around Britain's role in Africa in the earlier 20th century. The this the the stuff belonging to this emperor uh, this emperor we are told worked very closely with colonial britain and so hence the relationship with these women's grandfather the fiona bruce who's the presenter offers the following voiceover quote occasionally on the road show we see items that provide a fresh insight into britain's role in africa in the early 20th century and the contradictions and complexities of colonialism okay um i <sighs> feel like a few things on the one hand there hasn't been a request for these items to be returned potentially because nobody knew where they were however if the letters are as they seem to be and the this is a correspondent with a cultural exchange and gift giving I, there's a part of me that feels like this is a really low impact way for Antiques Roadshow and the BBC to look like they're prepared to ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. But are they going to ask the hard questions of the places that actually deserve to have the hard questions asked? And I wonder whether... Part of me feels like, and I'm very happy to be to have be to have this kind of contested and for people to offer a different point of view. Part of me feels like this expert asking these women this thing is such a kind of lowball. It's it's such an easy thing for them to do because there's not really any politics involved. It's not like the BBC is fronting up the British Museum and taking on the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, is it? That's not what's happening. This this just feels like we're going... And, and also, you know, talk to these ladies and have them, you know, nodding dog along, saying, yes, of course, if we were asked to return them, of course we would, because that's the correct answer, friends. And then, you know, Fiona Bruce can say, well, now we've now we've shown, we've talked about colonialism, we've done it, 
we, we haven't really, have you? You haven't you haven't really talked about the contradictions and complexities of colonialism. What you've what you've offered is something where the majority of people, even people who are in favour of repatriation, are going to go. But why? This hasn't been asked for, and it sounds very much like it was a gift, and not a gift in the way that the Cohenor was a gift. It actually then gives people who are against repatriation a stick to beat that conversation with. It's ser- to me, it serves the other argument. It's 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 not about we must do the right things with artifacts. I. Mm, I don't know. Maybe I'm being really judgmental and harsh. My husband's just messaged saying, uh, talking about Fiona Bruce, she asks harder questions on Antiques Roadshow than she does on Question Time. And he ain't, he ain't wrong. He ain't wrong. I mean, it feels like lip service to me because what it does is it's the women don't appear to be offended. They're not hurt by it. Nobody's asked for this to be returned. It's not actually a very contested object. And they said, yes, of course we will. So they look like good little girls who've behaved themselves. Meanwhile, people who are like, well, if we give stuff back to these, you know, terrible people who will break it, they don't know, they'll just sell it off or melt it down. The stuff that is said really offensively, this is going to be grist to their mill of, well, you know, this this was a present, obviously a present. I just, I feel, I feel like this doesn't do what they claim it does, but I think it may have done what they intended it to do. May, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't want it back. And the BBC is taxpayer funded and I, there, but in which case just don't do this at all. Just don't do this at all. I don't know. Anyway. The family of a late US billionaire has agreed to return looted artefacts to Cambodia. This is George Lindemann's family. There are 33 looted artefacts, and this has been described as a momentous uh, event by the uh, individuals in the southeast, but by the people who come from Cambodia. It's just, we've got statues of deities, angels and demons that date from the 10th and 12th centuries. The We are told that the decision to return these artefacts is voluntary, that lawyers for the family did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The sites in Cambodia, the archaeological sites in, in Cambodia were looted during civil wars in the 60s to 90s, 1960s, 1990s. And lots of things got smuggled out during this time. 27 antiquities were repatriated to Cambodia from the United States in 2021. And the artifacts that this, these artifacts in question that were held by the Lindemann family are expected to be repatriated later this year. Apparently, the family paid more than $20 million for these artifacts. Cambodia's Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, in a statement, said the Lindemann family's decision to return the artifacts set, quote, an excellent and proper example for other museums and private collectors. In June, in a speech to the American Chamber of Commerce, two months before becoming the leader of Cambodia, Prime Minister Hun Manet said the antiquities were national treasures and more than just historical relics. Quote, they are the blood in our veins and the soul in our hearts that forge the identity of being Khmer. Our heritage define who we are and what we will be. So a lot of the looted artefacts link back to Douglas Latchford, which is a name that we have talked about many times. So that's a, a, a good news day, a good news day. Uh, the Smithsonian has is returning a teenage girl's brain 
90 years after it was taken for race research. It's being called Darkest History. It was this brain was taken without her family's knowledge, reportedly to be part of race research. Mary Sara was an 18 year old Mari girl who died of tuberculosis in Seattle in 1993. Her doctor then mailed her brain to a Smithsonian anthropologist for his, quote, racial brain collection. The family petitioned to get the brain back and an employee flew from D.C. on August 28th. There is no record that they gave any consent. In fact, it was only discovered that it was missing when a D.C. paper revealed that at least 30,700 human remains were being stored at a Maryland storage facility of the Museum of Natural History. The Sarah's brain had been sent to Alice Hardlicker, who was then the curator of the Smithsonian's Division of Physical Anthropology. He was, we're told, known to believe in white supremacy. The museum said it was honoured to return Sarah's brain to her family. Quote, our museum community remains committed to addressing the historical legacy bestowed upon us and will continue to work with descendants and descendant communities to return or appropriately honour the individuals now under our care. Sarah's brain was the fifth to be returned to families or tribes, with another 254 remaining, the paper said. The Smithsonian last year adopted a policy that all, that formally authorised all of its museums to return items or remains in its collections that were obtained without consent. But they did tell the Washington Post that they were primarily focused on returning Native American remains, which leaves about 1,500 sets of remains, sorry, 15,000 sets of remains from more than 80 countries in limbo. There was a public apology in made in April which also announced the creation of a task force to determine next steps for the human remains that are still in the institution's custody. Just... Gross. But at least one step in the right direction. Hey, uh, the US has returned... Egon Shaley's, I apologise if, if I have pronounced that wrong, this is art that was stolen by Nazis to the heirs, This uh, seven artworks by this Austrian painter, to the heirs of a Jewish cabaret star who owned them before he was murdered by the Nazis in 1941. This is Fritz Grumbum's family. The pieces are valued at between $780,000 and $2.75 million, $2 million a piece, and some have been on display at prominent museums in the US. The claims about ownership prompted several law court, several courts to hear lawsuits about them because these pieces were never sold or surrendered by the original owner. In a ceremony on Monday, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg called the return of the artwork historic. The museums where the pieces were held include the Museum of Modern Art, so MoMA, the Morgan Library and Museum, which are both in New York, and also the Santa Barbara Museum of Art in California. A few of the pieces were also in the possession of Ronald Lauder, who is the president of the World Jewish Congress, and the estate of Serge Sabraski, a well-known art collector, both of whom agreed to return them. The original owner died, it was killed in Dachau and had owned 81 pieces by Shelley. His wife Elizabeth was forced to hand over the art collection to the Nazis when he was arrested in 1938. She also was killed in a concentration camp in 1942. These art pieces had been declared degenerate art by Adolf Hitler and so they were sold to finance the Nazi party. When uh, one of the relatives, Timothy Reef, said that the recovery had, quote, achieved a measure of justice for the victims of murder and robbery. When viewing these artworks, imagine Fritz and Elizabeth in their lively Vienna apartment, 
singing and dancing and cracking jokes. The New York State Supreme Court says that, quote, there is reasonable cause to believe that the artworks constitute stolen property. The pieces remain for now at the museums, whose officials have said they are confident in the legal ownership of art. A federal case is in progress to resolve the matter. So the, the return of some pieces does follow a notification by Manhattan pro prosecutors last week of their intent to seize three other works from galleries in Chicago, Pittsburgh and Ohio. They are the museums that believe that they have rightful ownership. If this has gone this way, I think that it's highly likely that they're going to be found to be incorrect about their belief in the legal ownership. Look at this cool little face. Look at it. These are valuable artefacts that date back to antiquities that have been smuggled to Florida in shoes. Once again, this is the uh, Scooby-Doo school of art theft. So um, how do they get there? CBP agricultural specialist Jose Carlos Estevez said that as officers were scanning luggage, they noticed some of the contents looked curious. So they started opening the bags and in one of the shoes the traveller had, they found the artefacts. It was actually concealed inside the shoes. These items are small enough to fit in there in your hand. And when they were seized, officers confirmed their authenticity from a pre-Columbian culture in Costa Rica. The officers were, were apparently immediately like, this is some kind of antiquity or historical item and it needs to be detained. There's been six years investigation and a diplomatic negotiation and diplomatic negotiations later and a ceremony with the Costa Rican consul signaled the items and that they are officially on their way home quite quote the value of archaeological objects is the highest value in regards to cultural heritage and we we want the future generations to have the chance to know where they came from and also what great culture we had in pre-Columbian times these items are made of clay they don't know what they're used for, but it is something that is going to be explored by local experts at their new home in the Costa Rica National Museum. So if you are planning a trip to Costa Rica or if you live in Costa Rica and you get a chance to go to that museum and see these artefacts when they arrive or when they're on display, rather, then um, let us know what you think. It does have a very boopable snoot. Lovely little boopable snoot. and. This is the, what what you're seeing here is I screenshotted this. There's a video. So if you go to the linked article, you can see this little boopable snoot being moved around. Now, has it got ritual purposes, Wheezy Squeezebox? Maybe. Uh, cannot confirm nor deny. It could. I mean, a lot of these things that they think have got ritual purposes, we then later find out they were for children to play with because it, it feeds into that myth that there was no such thing as childhood until the Victorians invented it. So all too often, things that are kids' toys have been called ritual because they uh, they didn't spot the fact that children play with them. And my husband has just told me the pronunciation for it's, it's Egon Schiller is how it should have been pronounced. So I apologise for that. And thank you to Mr Dr Cat in the texts for setting me right. He's a good egg. Good egg. I mean, for me, the boop of a snoot, when I snoop, when I, my husband says that snoop, snoop, he agrees. Snoop, snoop booping is a ritual because we have a chinchilla. And when her snoot gets booped, it's, there's ritual purposes behind that. Ritual purposes. Rural Kansas is going to be returning invaluable, a invaluable Peruvian artefact. Miami County Museum has become a repatriation project for its pre-Columbian collections. This collection was authenticated in 1991 when it was determined that the countries of origin were Mexico, Ecuador, Guatemala and Peru. After making not very much headway on this repatriation, the museum officials reached out to the US representative Sharice David's office to help them get in contact with the four embassies in Washington, D.C. And 
Uh, we are told that about a dozen Paola, res Paola residents, including the mayor, gathered inside the museum on Monday morning to wait for Liliana Trellis, who was sent to collect three artefacts on behalf of the General Consulate of Peru in Dallas. These artefacts were thought, are thought to be made between 200 BCE and 200 CE, and they come from the Nazca region in Peru. I think not to be confused with Nazca, which I believe is very different. Trellis has said that two of the three artefacts are quite likely to be replicas and have so been donated to the Texas consulate. But the third, a polychrome vessel, is likely to be an invaluable original. She says that she borrowed her son's school duffel bag for transportation, lined it with cardboard and, and tissue paper, and prepared the objects for the airplane ride back to Tesc Texas. So there we go. Uh, my chinchilla has never come up before. She has because uh, she did have a little. She did have her sister, and sadly, her sister passed away. But they have been in my Instagram posts in little Christmas hats. So. And she also, when I was, when we lived at our old place, she was also always in the room with me when I was filming. And so occasionally I would have to stop because she would uh, start running in her wheel. We have a very special wheel for chinchillas. Chinchillas are anybody and, and p people like pets at home and pets from our other stores are available. They will tell you that chinchillas are an ideal pet for children. If they tell you that, it's a gosh darn lie from the devil they are not everything tries to kill them they can't sweat you have to feed them very specific food you can't get them wet you have to bathe them in dust you have to be careful because they can apparently jump like six feet in the air um they're scared of everything they can't get too hot they can't get too cold don't you know it's like having a really angry gremlin <laughs> and also they can like bite through your finger they are super fragile, super fragile. Um, I think wild chinchillas that look like a cross between a really fat squirrel and a beaver. Wild chinchillas are slightly less uh, <laughs> breakable, but because domestic chinchillas have been bred for their fur, they've got this incredibly dense fur. And that's, and Elaine, that's why you can't get them wet, because if they get wet, then they can't dry themselves out properly because their fur is so dense. So you'll get like mold on their fur. Um, and yeah, it's, and th the other thing is that if, if they don't, you know, try and eat the tele, the television wires and give themselves an electric shock that like fries their brain. And if they don't eat too much plastic, you can't have any plastic in the cage to eat it. If you don't do any of those things, they can live for like 20 years. So you've just got 20 years. <laughs> of this just really fragile, um, angry hell beast living in your house. <laughs> we're, all, we're all scared. We're all scared of Starbuck. Gabriel knows because he loves her, but we have told him that he cannot put, he cannot let her out. Um, we have, we've put a child gate on his door in part because we don't trust him not to let her out. So we've got to cage our child <laughs> to stop our chinchilla from getting him it's 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 a whole situation my husband has currently got chinchilla cam um you might be able to see uh up the top there her creepy little glowing eyes yeah as he says fuzzy baby so that there we go that's we've got a chinchilla she's called starbuck Let's get back to the history news. That was a detour, wasn't it? <laughs> Actually, now we are moving away from repatriations. Just one more. Um, the most. The most high-maintenance pet. The most. And they are... They are. My husband is shaking his head that it's not high-maintenance. That's a, that's a lie. Also, no vets can take them. You need to take them to a specialist exotic vet as well. So... We for, for our vet is a 50 minute drive <laughs> from where we live, which I know is not a lot in America, but in London, that is a long way. And you've got to get the little darling princess, sweet thing, into her carrying case without you know her breaking you or you breaking her. 
The dramas, the dramas. So she doesn't go to the vet very often because <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> it's a terrifying procedure. The we are on to new news now. This I was sent this a lot. This is really cool. A five hundred thousand year old pieces of wood have been discovered in Zambia and we are told they have no known parallels in the world according to archaeologists. These are the earliest evidence of wooden structures. This has been these finds have been published in the Nature Journal on Wednesday. They have found the scientists have found wooden structures and tools such as digging sticks. These have been found at the Kalambo Falls in Zambia and they date back to more than 476,000 years ago. These structures, which may have been built by early humans, are raised platforms to stay above wet ground, we think. There are no known parallels. This discovery reshapes our understanding of what early humans were capable of. And that's because these findings are showing how early humans use large tree trunks to make structures and platforms, as well as their use of wooden tools. These structures predate the earliest known Homo sapiens fossils. This is from Jeff Duller, who is co-author of the study and a professor at the University of Aberystwyth. He told CNN on Wednesday, he said that the researchers were uncertain about which species of ancient human had in fact created them. But Homo sapiens is, of course, the one that modern humans do belong to. Early humans, we are told, also made mysterious, deliberately made mysterious stone spheroids. These... These are early ancestors of humans that deliberately made stones into spheres 1.4 million years ago. This, and we don't know what why they did this or what they were used for. These are tennis ball sized spheroids. Were they made with the aim of crea crea crafting a perfect sphere, or were they an accidental byproduct? But new research that's being led by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem suggests that they, they were intentionally made. Because while they were being made, the uh, spheroids, spheroids did not become smoother, but they did become more spherical. This is important because while nature can make pebbles smoother, such as in a river or stream, they almost never approach a truly spherical state. This in turn indicates that our ancient relatives had the cognitive capacity to plan and carry out such work. This same technique could apparently be used on other spheroids, so it might shed light on the oldest known spheroids, which date back two million years, that were found in the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Why our ancestors went to the effort of creating this does remain a mystery. There are theories that include that they were trying to make a tool that could extract marrow from bones or grind up plants. Some have suggested that the spheroids could have been used as projectiles, that they may have, or they may have had symbolic or artistic purposes. All hypotheses are possible, we are told, and that we're probably never going to know the answer. Interesting, though, isn't it? I think I like the notion that they're slingshotty, like little cannibals. But equally, you could just put any old rock in that. Doesn't need to be spherical, does it? I mean, unless they figured out, because there are more aerodynamic, aerodynamic things you could do as well. So it doesn't do that function. Interesting. A hollowed out 4,000 year old tree trunk coffin has been found in a golf course's pond. This is a rare Bronze Age sarcophagus that contained human remains, an axe, and plant bedding. This was found in July 2019 by construction workers who were renovating a pond at a golf course in Tetney in England. And I'll be honest, I don't know where Tetney is. It's in England, and I'm assuming it's somewhere fairly close to Lincoln, as it's set to go on. This is set to go on display at the Collection Museum in Lincoln. 
Per a statement from the University of Sheffield, the half-ton sarcophagus contained human remains and axe and plants used as a bed for the deceased. Quote, it's amazing how well preserved the axe is with its handle still there like it was made yesterday. This is Mark Caswell, who's the owner of Tetney Golf Club, presumably where it's been found. We'll have a nice photograph of it up on the clubhouse wall. All those years that people have been living here and working the land, it's certainly something to think about when you're playing your round of uh, on the course. Absolutely. And the axe is just incredible. Where the burial was found, this is from archaeologist Hugh Wilmot, myself and a team of staff and students were working on a nearby research and training excavation. This was a brilliant learning experience for our students to see what can be achieved at short notice, and I'm so pleased we were able to help. To prevent this axe from deteriorating, archaeologist Adam Daubney placed it in a bag filled with groundwater. The coffin, meanwhile, was kept in cold storage for a year before being moved to the York Archaeological Trust, where it then went underwent an arduous process of being restored. Historic England then awarded the project to do this almost £70,000, which is about $96,000. Um, what an incredible find. We are They are harping on about the axe, a perfectly preserved wooden handle with a stone head. The sarcophagus, though, is itself also incredibly rare. We Only about 65 early Bronze Age log coffins have been found in Britain to this point, and this is one of them. But the plant bedding, we're told, proves to be the most exciting. He put on, he and he said so when he was talking about it on Twitter, rather X. It's made of moss, yew or juniper, hazelnuts and leaf buds, which suggests that this person would have been buried in late spring. The hazelnuts might have been a food offering, while the moss could have functioned as a bed for the occupant of the coffin. They haven't been able to do DNA analysis on the remains, but they and they are also they are still trying to precisely date the coffin. They need to do some radiocarbon dating and dendro. The man buried at Tetney lived for a, in a very different world to ours, says Tim Allen, not Toolman Tim, who is a Sheffield-based archaeologist for Historic England. Quote, but like ours, it was a changing environment. Rising sea levels and coastal flooding ultimately covered his grave and burial mound in a deep layer of silt that aided its preservation. I support this message. We don't dead name people. We don't do that. But considering uh, how Elon Musk treats his daughter... Uh, X can be called Twitter and, until until it ex implodes in the space Karen stratosphere of his nonsense. Archaeologists have discovered a previously unknown Indo-European language in Turkey. This, they have been conducting excavations at, oh, I'm definitely going to butcher this, Bagozgi Hatusa, and they have found this language inscribed on a cuneiform tablet. This is the capital of the Hittite Empire, which was and the Hittites are an ancient Anatolian people established who established an empire covering Anatolia, the northern Levant, and Upper Mesopotamia. This the city that they're talking about covered at its peak an area of 444 acres, with an inner and outer precinct surrounded by a course of walls that protected a population of around 40,000 to 50,000 people. Hattusa was destroyed along with the Hittite state in around 12,000 BCE during the Bronze Age collapse, which is the period that saw a collapse of many major cities and civilizations throughout the Near East, Anatolia, the Aegean region, North Africa, the Caucasus, the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean. 
These excavations have found this tablet containing a cultic ritual text. Don't say it out loud. If anybody from this is listening, don't, don't, if you can translate it, don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. Just let's be safe. Um, it's written Hittite in a hitherto unknown language. According to Professor Daniel Schwerer, the head of the Chair of Ancient Near Eastern Studies uh, at a Julius Maximus University, which is in Germany, said that the text refers to a language from the land of Kalasma, which is an area in the northwestern edge of the Hittite heartland. And uh, the Hittites were uniquely interested in recording rituals in foreign languages, such ritual texts written by scribes of the Hittites, reflect various Anatolian, Syrian and Mesopotamian traditions in and linguistic milieus. The rituals provide a valuable glimpse into the little-known linguistic landscape of late Bronze Age Anatolia, where not just Hittite was spoken. This Kalasmaic text is as yet largely incomprehensible. Cool, that means you can't speak it out loud. <laughs> Learn things, but not everything needs to be spoken out loud. Doesn't we can read in our heads? In our heads. And I don't know, not near a full moon or a body of water or a fire or earth or I don't know, just nothing that could potentially be ritually. Okay. Um this it's confirmed the idiom belongs to the family of Anatolian Indo-European languages. Okay, so interesting, but also <laughs> nobody needs this. Is a, that's a bad day out <laughs> when you're like, oh, hang on, I've just done an accidental ritual. I don't know what I believe, but what I do know is that sometimes you f around and you find out, <laughs> and the mind is a powerful thing, which is why I will, there are many things I will never do, including trying to channel the dead or a Ouija board. Absolutely not. Ne never. You couldn't be me. Could not be me. Let's not have any ritual whoopsies. <laughs> Let's not. Not, not today. If you, if you know what you're doing, you crack on. This is not, this is not an area to go blindfolded in on a journey of discovery and if it's a closed practice keep it closed keep it closed it if it ain't for you it ain't for you it, exactly we are too close to october for this <laughs> don't say it out loud <laughs> What we have as well, though, look at this. Look at these. A Spanish water worker has found these necklaces on a hillside. Aren't they incredible? And they are thought to be around 2,500 years old. They've been found in northwestern Spain, in, in Asturias. It was These were just found in amongst some rocks. He, he was out doing a job. He didn't even have his little beep-beep machine. And... Uh, Beep, beep machine, metal detector. That's what I'm looking for, a beep, beep machine. Uh, so we are. this is, as they are saying, really impressive. When other gold necklaces from the Iron Age have been found, most were discovered in the 18th or 19th century, when limited archaeological techniques meant that much of the information about their provenance was lost. But in this case, the site where these have been found remains intact. And so... We can learn a lot of context. We've got very precise information about where this has been found. It's quite exceptional. These necklaces show sign of wear on areas that mean it would have been in constant in contact with the wearer's skin and clothes. So we know that these were worn and used, but also by somebody who existed in the very upper echelons of society, because not everyone's going to be able to afford these kinds of necklaces. The regional government in Asturias praised the person who found it, a man by the name of Marciandi, for informing officials of the find straight away, saying that this find was an extraordinary development, considering their quality and the skill of the artisans that made them. 
and most of all for opening a window to the study and knowledge of the most emblematic type of jewellery of Iron Gold, Iron Age gold work, which had until now been closed. Thank you, Barbara, for the super sticker. That's very kind of you. I really appreciate that. Thank you for, for being for your generosity. Very kind. Thank you. And we have uh, more Hittite history. Archaeologists have found seal impressions, seal impressions that could change Hittite history in, I think it's Kalimpur. This is in the Anatolian region of Turkey. We're talking about Hatsul the III, who's one of the most famous Hittite kings. And there was a battle of Kadesh and the subsequent Kadesh peace treaty. But not only was this king successful in his military exploits, both before and after he, he assumed kingship, he and his wife instituted religious reforms within the kingdom, the Hittite kingdom, and also engaged in extensive diplomatic relations with other the great powers of the time. He ruled the Hittite lands between 1267 and 1237 BCE. Archaeologists have been, have been excavating this site where this has been found. It's uh, They've been excavating it since 2004. And according to the team they who have been collaborating with international scientists, they are now making significant progress at the site. They carried out four excavations in four areas and in the excavations, they uncovered significant architectural remnants and important artefacts. In one of the trenches, they were able to understand the stratigraphy of the excavation. And among the most important finds are the seal impressions that could potentially change Hittite history. These are seals imprinted on clay and they have managed to survive until the present day. They've been found in a burned building that was excavated. After consultations and discussions, they would like to designate the structure where these have been found as the Imperial Archive. We can see that there is a very significant Hittite Imperial Archive in this location. They guessed there was a burning shelf in the area where they found these seal impressions and said, quote, during the Hittite period, they used to wrap strings around wooden tablets and they would imprint seals on those strings. These seals have survived to the present day, but the wooden tablets turned to ashes due to the fire. If I found something, if I found something and I thought to myself, like the person who found the WS ring outside the church where William Shakespeare is buried, Holy Trinity, if I found that, if I found these seal impressions, if I, if I was like, had any idea, I would be, I would, if I was holding it in my hands, I would just be so terrified of dropping it or, you know, when you get those kind of thoughts in your head, they're just like, don't eat it. Don't eat that thing. That's where my brain would go. I'd look at that seal and go, that's not a candy. Don't eat that. And I'd be like, why are you thinking about eating it? Is a part of you going to eat it? And then I'd be scared I was going to eat it. Um, but maybe that was a confession that I should have kept to myself. Onwards, I got sent this one a lot, a lot. New discoveries in the sea, in the in the water off the Egyptian coast, are revealing treasures and secrets. This is the we've got the site of a sunken temple off of Egypt's Mediterranean coast. This is an underwater archaeological team has made further discoveries at a site to the temple. It's a temple to the god Armun. This is part of the ancient port city of Thonis Heraklion, and the team investigated the city's south canal where huge blocks of stone from the ancient temple collapsed uh, during a cataclysmic event dated to the mid-2nd century BCE. I'm pleased. I said it out loud and I thought you probably should have kept that to yourself. Uh, I'm glad that I'm, I'm not the only one that goes, don't eat that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't eat that. Don't don't push them over. Don't do that. But it's that kind of thing where you see where you see like scissors and go, don't cut your hair off. And you think to yourself, why am I thinking about cutting my hair off? I'm not going to cut my hair off, but you think you might. 
cut your hair off. And and that and then you're like, I need a nap. <laughs> Sorry for a nap. <laughs> Don't put just anything in your mouth. Well, you could have told me that when I was at university. <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> and a lot of people say the five second rule. Agree. Agree. But in these days, in these times, sometimes when you to be honest, <laughs> when you've got a kid, uh, my my boundaries on what is gross and what isn't have been pushed to the limits because of my child. I, I think I told I think I tweeted about this. He comes wandering up to us. He's been out in the garden. He comes wandering up to us, clutching one of his I assume his cereal bars. I think to myself, well, I haven't just given him one of those. I don't think he's had one today, but he's approached me from the garden holding it. And so I went, um, where did you get the bar from that you're eating that's in your face currently? And this child looked at me like a cherub and just went, bush. Don't know which bush. <laughs> don't know which bush. Um, the phrase of the moment is don't lick that. <laughs> Don't lick it. So um, with that in mind, the five second rule just feels so pointless when this kid is finding chips down the... He's taken a chip that he had in the car from about five months ago. And he's just chowing down. He's found that on the back of the seat. Thought I'll have that. And he, I mean, he must have an iron stomach because he hardly ever gets sick. Hmm. <laughs> 5,000 year rule snack of destiny although with that being said thinking about the amount of time the Victorians spent eating bits of mummy <laughs> he's, he's, also, he's also there are kids because he's, he's he's got mine and my husband's height so he is literally smaller than everybody else as well but with this massive head and these enormous feet so he is in fact a hobbit <laughs> Hadrian, um... is your is your brother part feline? <laughs> in my head, he's got a sparrow in his mouth. Like I brought you a present, mummy. <laughs> oh. oh dear, <laughs> he's he's building up his immune system. <sighs> Good. <laughs> this is good. You spend all this time when they're first born going, oh, I'm going to be so careful. No sugar, blah, blah, blah. That, that, that no plan survives first contact because my child has licked an ice cream. And so now all he wants is chocolate and sweets and pizza <laughs> and chicken chips and beans. And apparently, bars that have been found in a bush <laughs> I, I i mean go down the garden center and they're in every good garden center it's a bush that grows your cereal bars for you <laughs> oh. yeah kids kids will keep you the lager they will the lager decade <laughs> um as well as this, though, in addition to the Temple of Armoon, they've also found a Greek san sanctuary devoted to Aphrodite, and that was found to contain bronze and ceramic objects, which illustrates that the Greeks, who were allowed to set, trade and settle in the city during the time of the pharaohs of the Saites dynasty, Saites dynasty, had sanctuaries to their own gods. Discoveries of Greek weapons also reveal the presence of Greek mercenaries in the area. Quote, they were defending the access to the kingdom at the mouth of the canopic branch of the Nile. This branch was the largest and best navigable one in antiquity. So there we go. My husband's asked if we need to put Gabriel in charge of the object, and I'm thinking, no, we don't need to put him in charge of the object because he, if I think about eating it, he'll definitely eat it. Forbidden foraging. Yes, he is a <laughs> he is a venture scout, I think, in the making. <laughs> Looting of a coin hoard site is prompting a call for a survey. This is a 
site in Jersey. I, I think I think they mean Jersey off the coast of the UK rather than Jersey in the United States. I'm thinking. So this is the Le Catillon, sec the second hoard, discovered in the east of the island in 2012, and it was found by two mesh detectorists who, after a similar find, was found on the site in 1957. The hoard contains about 70,000 coins as well as valuable Iron Age artefacts. And they, they want to be able to carry out archaeological surveys in the same area of the island. And this has been prompted by recent instances of night hawking and archaeological looting, which has been reported since 2021. I th I'm guessing so. I'm guessing. I'm guessing we're going old Jersey, not New Jersey. This is, of course, a serious matter. This looting, and they want to preserve the site and recover any artifacts to avoid further loss through this illegal activity. In other countries, we're told you might put up cameras, but the person in charge thinks that the best thing to do is talk to the public and to tell them this practice is not practice is not accessible. Jersey is a small place, so everybody does know everybody. Um, I think in many many ways, they they they. This this kind of public information campaign, I think, will work better on Jersey than it would potentially somewhere else. This is just a group of two or maybe three people, and the large majority of metro protectorists on the island are very aware they don't go to listed sites. We feel we should do something, and depending on the results of the survey, we're going to address this issue. The site, we're told, is Grade 1 listed, with objects discovered related to the late Iron Age or the start of the Roman period. An H ribbon wall has just emerged in Switzerland. This is very interesting. So we're told that only a few structural relics of this kind from the Roman period are known in the pre-Alpine regions. What's astounding is the relatively good preservation of the remains. And this elevated location would have offered a fabulous set of views of the surrounding landscape. They don't know what the monumental building that was placed there actually functioned as, but possibilities include a grand villa with a great view or potentially a temple. Iron nails have been found in huge quantities at the site, which hint at there being a wooden construction on this wall foundation. This location has over the years proved popular for inhabitants. The Department of Pre the, uh, the head of the Department of Prehistory and Prehistoric Archaeology at the Archaeology Society, Zug, said we were also amazed that the top bricks were even visible above the ground. Experts on the site found everyday items and more exclusive objects from Roman times. They found tableware, uh, glass vessels, fragments of amphora in which precious liquids like wine, olive oil and fish sauce were brought from the Mediterranean to this area near Sham. And thus it pinpoints and highlights the extensive trade routes of Roman times. They found gold fragments, probably they think jewellery. Copper and bronze coins were also part of the discovery, including a denarius, denarius featuring Julius Caesar, which dates from the first century BCE. The researchers investigating the area hope they're going to the file is going to provide important insights into Romans in pre-Alpine central Switzerland. They're going to carry on searching the area and they will always have that view. Archaeologists have found a statue of Triton in a Roman mausoleum. This has been found during preparation for a housing development in Kent. Triton is the god of the sea from the Greek pantheon and the son of Poseidon and Amphi Amphitrite. Greek and Roman depictions of Triton generally represent the god as a merman with the merman, with the lower half of that being a fish, with the top being a human figure. The Chartway Partnerships Group 
these are the archaeologists that discovered a mausoleum set in a walled and ditched enclosure close to the A2 London Road, which does follow Watling Street. They said that they expected to find interesting Roman archaeology, perhaps a cemetery. But the finds, including the lively and unique statue of a triton and the mausoleum remains, have by far exceeded what they expected. These finds are now part of Tenham's local legacy and the nation's rich Roman story. Further study is going to take place to put these finds within their historical context. According to press statement, these the association suggests the enclosure complex and central mausoleum was a funerary site of a wealthy local family, possibly associated with a Roman villa that was previously found at Bax Farm further to the north and was dedicated to Roman maritime deities. I'm sorry. What? (laughs) What? Intercourse, Blue Ball and Paradise, Pennsylvania. Are these nightclubs (laughs) or locations? (laughs) Fabulous. Loving that work. Loving that work. Uh, We've got another Roman find. We have a Roman fridge found at Nove. And I'm sure that this mini bar did not have a Toblerone in it. Not that I could eat that anyway, because the nuts would kill me. This is archaeologists from the University of Warsaw who've discovered a Roman fridge when excavating a Roman fortress. This is what Nove is one of the primary legionary forces Uh, along the Danube in northern Bulgaria. Over time, the settlement evolved into a thriving town within the Roman province of Mosia Inferior, eventually becoming a part of Mosea Secunda. This fortress was constructed during the first century CE, and it serves as a base of operations during the campaigns against the barbarian tribes during Trajan's Dacian Wars in the early second century CE. There have, for the several decades, this fortress is being excavated by researchers and the current project was led by people from the University of Warsaw. They have, in these set of excavations, they have uncovered a complex of wooden and earth military barracks that measure 60 metres in length by 38 metres in width. These barracks were garrisoned by the Legio 8 Augusta, Augustus's 8th Legion, which is one of the oldest legion in the Roman M- Roman army. The team also found a system of aqueducts made with ceramic and lead pipes. Lead's great for drinking water, I've been told. <laughs> uh, they also found a ceramic container that has been identified as an ancient Roman fridge. This is the second Roman fridge to be found at Nove. However, the latest fridge was also found with fragments of wine drinking vessel, bowls and animal bones in situ. They have found a ceramic furnace from the 4th century CE, a set of drinking vessels for wine, decorated vessels with smooth and comb motif, and over 200 various artefacts, including, pictured, an ornate crafted silver mouse. Isn't it sweet? What a sweet little mouse. I whenever I used to drive down to the south coast and I would see Upper Dicker I did laugh I did laugh <laughs> I did laugh at that because I'm a uh, child <laughs> swords Roman swords have been found in the UK these are Roman cavalry swords discovered in the Cotswold district they've got remnants of their wooden scabbards and fitments This is being described as an amazing discovery. A local man by the name of Glenn Manning found the swords while taking part in a metal detectorist rally. We all have the wrong hobby, friends. We need to team up. We need to get ourselves a a little legion of child discoverers, child explorers, 
It sounds a little bit like we're going to send them down the mines to dig in the earth, but you know what I mean. We're going to get them all little metal detectors. We're going to follow them with metal detectors. It's going to be a fun time. This is what we need to all be doing. Alongside the sword, he also found a copper alloy bowl. And these finds date back to around the year 160 CE, when the Roman Empire was in full swing. This is really pointing out how deep the Cotswolds history goes. And this is, of course, from a time when Cirencester was the second biggest town in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. He'll have to be closely supervised. But here's the other thing. His desire to put things he shouldn't in his mouth might mean that he finds something really special. And if we get to it in time <laughs> before that dumpster <laughs> shoves it in his face, we might be fine. I mean, I think if you, you probably have to um, ask permission. I would recommend that. I wouldn't just purloin an infant. I'd probably ask permission. But honestly, if you're offering parents an afternoon off, they'll probably pay for your mesh detector and theirs. <laughs> Crack on. See you at sundown. <laughs> um these we think that they think that they're cavalry weapons because of the length that they have. And so that, that sort of does make some sense. These swords went to Leicester University for an archaeology professor to have a look at them. And the weapons are commonly known as spaffa. In terms of parallels, he can't think of finds of more than one sword being deposited in any similar circumstance in Roman Britain. The closest thing that brings to mind was a pair of similar swords found in Canterbury with their owners face down in a pit within the city walls, clearly a clandestine burial, almost certainly a double moider. Moider. These finds have gone to the Corinium Museum, where they're going to be preserved and looked after for future generations. And I hope put on display so we can see them. I'm not going to repeat this, but I'm going to put it on screen because that is incredible. <laughs> I might have to move. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. And they sometimes bring cookies as well. This is perfect. This will get ourselves a guide and scout troop. They'll bring the cookies and they probably have their own mesh detectors and we can just love uh and and celebrate the achievement of the discovery. They'll do all the hard work. <laughs> we have got a surviving example of Cleopatra's handwriting. It is just the one word. It's found on ancient papyrus and the word in Greek translates to make it happen or so be it. This dates back to 33 BCE and it grants a tax exemption to a Roman officer who was closely connected to Mark Antony. According to this papyrus, the officer in question was permitted to annually export 10,000 bags of wheat and import 5,000 amphora of wine without taxation. However, what captured the imaginations was a Greek proscript, which could be translated as make it so, believed to be in Cleopatra's handwriting, thus hinting at her direct involvement. This paper, we are told, was signed two years before the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. In that prominent fight, Mark Antony and Cleopatra faced defeat against the then Roman Emperor Octavian Augustus. How cool is that? What an incredible thing. Now, this one did come with uh, images of human remains, and they are pretty cool, but obviously we don't show human remains, so I, it's not here. But if you do want to have a look, um, then you will see the link in the description box. This is a mummy thought to be about a 1,000 years old who's been found in Peru from the pre-Inca Yashma culture. And 
this mummy is buried in a simple circular grave on top of a pyramid, which, which is located in a residential area in Lima. This pyramid stands more than 70 feet tall and it has seven staggered platforms and was constructed in between AD 200 and 700. This is the site is an important ceremony, ceremonial center for these ancient people. The site has three clearly defined periods of occupation in the era before Spanish colonization. And this is from the last occupation that entered this, the culture that entered the region around about 1000 CE before being absorbed into the Inca Empire in the 15th century. Excavations that were being conducted this year found this individual tomb with human remains at the top of the pyramid, and it's associated with this Yixma culture. Archaeologists found the individual inside sitting in a flexed position with his feet, with his face facing south. The body was wrapped in a simple fabric of which only some parts have been preserved. The grave also contains several other artefacts, including ceramic vessels, which enabled archaeologists to date the burial to the early years of the Ixma culture. Mummies and ancient offerings have been found before at this site, but previously discovered artefacts from these this community's burials at the site have not featured the type of decoration found in the newly uncovered uh, grave. The archaeologist who has been working on this site said, I find it quite interesting that right at the heart of Miraflores, in the middle of the city, surrounded by modern buildings and constructions, an important site such as Huaca Puklana Ceremonial Centre is still preserved. Yeah, um, other articles do make a lot of the fact that this mummy is has got a full head of hair. Um, so if you do choose to look at it, it it's it's very obviously uh, mummified human remains. So if that's not going to be something that you want to see, then um, don't <laughs> look. Talking about our child excavators, we've got a little eight-year-old to join the legion of extraordinary child explorers and discoverers. While walking down a beach, eight-year-old Bruno Telema made an amazing discovery. He found a small-looking, strange-looking block of metal that turned out to be an ancient Viking belt buckle. They were spending their summer vacation on a Swedish island called Gotland. He'd just been given a book about fossils, and because of that, he was scouring the ground with his eyes. And then he caught sight of this glinting buckle. He didn't realise at first what it was. He picked it up and kept walking. His mum then asked him what he had in his hands, and she couldn't really believe what was there. It, This object was caved and carved into the shape of an animal's head and intricately de decorated. Three archaeologists were sent out to have a look at it, and Bruno then took them to the exact spot where he'd made the discovery. Very good. Very good, Bruno. Well done. And then Gotland's museum carried out a full investigation of the site. They weren't disappointed. They found another suit buckle, this one shaped like a ring. Very good, Bruno. The buckles are both made of bronze and belong to costumes from the late Iron Age or early Viking Age. It's thought that these buckles were designed as animal heads are usually associated with female graves, while ring buckles are found in both male and female graves. It's believed that the grave was most likely disrupted at an earlier point, with the buckles coming to the service as the earth was ploughed. The buckles are being set for preservation. Their ultimate fate will be determined by the National Antiquities Authority, in Sweden, Bruno is just excited that he can tell people about the discovery at last because they were asked to keep it a secret until it had been properly examined, until the site had been properly examined. Bruno is really proud of what he found and he's happy that he can tell people about it. He's even started thinking about becoming an archaeologist when he grows up. His dream is to find a T-Rex skull. And I hope, Bruno, that some years from now, I will be reading a story about you finding something incredible. Staying with the Vikings, they have found 
a horse bridle that may stem from the Viking Age. And I mean, considering how old it is and it's leather that it's preserved, that is fabulous. This strap or halter, which is attached to the bit, is ex especially exciting for archaeologists. I can imagine it would be because it makes it possible to date the horse bridle because they can carbon date it. And thus they'll be able to find out if it really was from the Viking Age or not. It will take a few months to get this final answer. But they are fairly certain that it, it does originate from the late, from the Iron Age or early Middle Ages. The bridle is not the only thing they found. They in, On this particular expedition, they also found horse manure, textiles, horseshoes, leaf fodder, part of a horse snowshoe, a knife and a variety of small wooden objects. Altogether, they found about 150 items. And even though this mountain pass this was found is a gold mine for archaeologists, the finds, these finds are extremely rare in the grand scheme of things. Having organic material like wood, leather or textiles to have been preserved is quite fabulous. And it's one of the reasons is because the ice froze it, the ice at that height. But now that ice is melting. And so it is being discovered. This incredible thing has been found and it's evidence of man-made climate change. The paradox is that this new ex and exciting knowledge about the common past is emerging, but there may there will be a price to be paid for it. Look at these. Look at these shinies. Um, the University of Oslo's Museum of Cultural History archaeologists have discovered a votive gold hoard in Norway. Excavations have found five tiny pieces of regular sheet gold decorated with motifs and stamped with imagery depicting a man and a woman. These objects were discovered in the remains of a pagan temple. Where previous excavations have uncovered 30 similar stamped gold objects in the vicinity over the past three decades. The building they were found in measures around 15 metres in length, and it was thought that it was used for ritual drinking. However, it is unlikely that any feasting took place due to the lack of domestic archaeological evidence. These latest objects were found beneath the structure in the wall runs and in adjacent post holes, suggesting they were ritually placed as votive offerings in the form of a sacrifice or religious act to protect the building uh, before it was constructed. These objects date to between AD or CE 550 to the Viking Age and may have been temple money for ritual entry. Nikolai Ekoff from the University of Oslo said, quote, they could also be interpreted ideologically as representing mythical ancestors or the descendants of chiefs and first families and may then have served as an authentication of the ruling family's political power, political demands and ruling role. It's also suggested that the couple motifs reflect the Hiragami myth, the holy wedding between the god Fry and the Jotun daughter Gerd, or they may have been used as an offering when celebrating a wedding uh, or fertility rituals. This is not just rituals. This is ritual. That's like the M&S ads, Marks and Spencer's ad. <laughs> ritual drinking. I hope that you are enjoying the uh the mug mine is currently downstairs being washed but my stickers have arrived uh here's one i'm really pleased with how they turned out i'm figuring out what i'm going to stick it on and i got a small one as well with my with uh reading the past on it so yeah i'm i think they look i'm really pleased with how how cool they look uh and i'm currently working on a, on a new piece of merch that i'm going to get sent to me to see how it looks yes More gold? Anyone? An amateur treasure hunter has discovered a trove of six a trove of sixth century gold jewellery in Denmark. We have got twenty two objects that have been found by first time treasure hunter by the name of Ol Glinnerup Schitz, 
uh, only been out with his new metal detector for a few hours when he stumbled on this bad boy. Can you imagine? I would be buying a lottery ticket the very afternoon, that very afternoon. This is one of the most important finds we're told in Danish history. Isn't it incredible? And uh, what we have here, this is probably the biggest fire that's come in 40 years. The hall consists primarily of bracteates, which are medallions that were popular in Northern Europe during the migration period, which is roughly 300 to 700 CE. Women would have worn the pendants, which were often inscribed with magical symbols or runes for protection. The symbolism represented on these objects make them unique, more than the quantity found. One of the medallions represents the Norse god Odin, and it appears to be based on similar Roman jewellery that celebrated emperors as gods. Here we see Nordic mythology in its infancy. The Scandinavians have always been good at getting ideas from what they saw in foreign countries and then turning it into something that suits them. Uh, older artefacts in the cache include gold coins from the Roman Empire that were constructed into jewellery. They've got images of Constantine the Great on some of them. This coin's presence suggests that Yelling, which was known to be a cradle of Viking civilization in between the 8th and 12th centuries, was a centre of power with trade links across the European continent. We're seeing immaculate craftsmanship that points to the owner's probable high status. We're told that only a member at the absolute top of society could have collected a treasure like the one that's been found here. They are positing that this gold was buried to protect from invaders or perhaps as a last ditch offering to the gods. The find is dated to around 536 when a volcanic eruption in Iceland covered the sky in ash and caused widespread famine in Scandinavia. Other gold troves have been found in the region, including 32 artefacts that were uncovered on the island of Harno that date to around this same time. It's a venerable bead, anybody? It has been suggested that notes in a Bible margin could be the handwriting of the venerable bead. He is called that because of his life of scholarship, considered one of the most influential thinkers in the post Roman world, acknowledged as a saint in the Orthodox, Catholic, and Anglican traditions. But now a leading academic thinks that she has identified an example of Bede's handwriting. Michelle Brown, the British Library's former curator of illuminated manuscripts, told The Observer that extensive evidence within two manuscripts makes a compelling and exciting case that can link them to this 8th century monk. In the preface to the Book of Kings in the coding, Codex Amatinus, the Bible that was taken to Rome from Jarrow in 715, which is now in a Florentine archive. Parallels are found between the grammar and linguistics within annotated passages and Bede's writings. What has been noted is, is the sophistication of an exceptional scholar rather than a mere scribe. She singles out complex Greek letter forms in the mar margins and a distinctive lightning flash that Bede pioneered to highlight quotations. So before the Henry VIII manicule, where you've got his finger doing this, there was the lightning bolt. She said, quote, we know that Bede knew Greek. Not that many people did know Greek at the time. So we've got marginalia and the way in which he marks up the little zigzag lines that look like lightning flashes he invented, like a little yellow magic marker to indicate when he was quoting a passage, a passage of the Old Testament period in the New Testament, for example. So it's got these markups that he's only inventing around this period. He's referring to Old Testament use of the word scribe as a priestly function for writing scripture. And given that this codex is such an an incredible intellectual feat. It's unthinkable that Bede's hand would not be present. Brown, who worked at the British Library for 28 years, is Professor Emerita 
of medieval manuscript studies at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. She said of the evidence, you haven't got a smoking quill. It doesn't say bead, but all of the evidence together. And I think this is as good an argument as has been advanced. She has is putting her discoveries in a new book that's titled Bead and the Theory of Everything that's going to be published in October. We have talked uh, in previous episodes on a few occasions about so-called deviant burials. Uh, and by that, I don't mean the burial of deviants. I do mean burials that deviate from the accepted norms and traditions of the time in which they occurred. And if we frequently get it with rather hyperbolic articles about vampire burial found in Poland, blah, 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 blah. And, and it's this sort of um, monstering of the remains that have been found because they've got a chain around their toe or their ankle or a sickle over their neck. And as I always say, that this is a person who almost certainly was ostracised by their community in life with a vast likelihood of something they could not control, who then is further othered in death. So we have here, this unusual burial of a teenage girl offers insight into the fate of those considered to be outsiders in medieval England. Archaeologists working near Cambridge, England, have discovered the remains of a young girl who lived sometime between the 8th or 9th century. She was buried face down, which is unusual for the time. This girl, aged about 15, was found during the excavation of a settlement that was abandoned by its community in the 9th century. And it's believed that shortly before leaving, the enclosure's elaborate entrance was dismantled and the girl was interred inside one of the deep pits that was left after removal of a large wooden post. Her remains were discovered face down, while the position of her legs suggests that she may have been buried with her ankles tied together. These are not typical practices of the time. Another example of a face down burial recorded at the town of Hyam Ferrers, around 30 miles away. This person had been executed because they were missing their arms, head, neck, and fourth lumbar. It is thought that these face down burials are reserved for members of the community that were deemed to be other in some way, whether that's social status, appearance, disability or some other reason. This interpretation is supported by the belief that unusual burials were often relegated to the outer boundary of a settlement, which is the case at Higham Ferrers. These, this girl's bones have been examined and it's found that her short life was tough. She had malnutrition and spinal joint disease, which was likely worsened by hard manual labour. There's no evidence of prolonged illness, so the girl might have died suddenly. As well as being buried face down on the boundary, the position of her ankles suggests they may have been tied together, which implies the community took extra measures to ensure she could not return from the grave. The similar motives were suggested when a Roman skeleton was unearthed face down in Northamptonshire in 2017. The fact that he's buried face down in the grave is consistent with somebody whose behaviour marks them as odd or threatening. It's a way of stopping the corpse from rising from the grave to menace the living. Other significant items found in the 350 hectare designated area include 11 woolly mammoth tusks, 15 Iron Age Roman settlements and around 15,000 objects, including jewelries and coins. This dig is one of the, the largest and most complex ever taking place in the UK and was carried out by the Museum of London Archaeology headline infrastructure where they have a team of some 30 experts who are still in the process of recording and analysing these remarkable finds. Doesn't say doesn't say in the article. Um, I, wa I wonder if there is uh, a reason why they haven't gone down that route. I mean, it could the tying could be about a line of the body, but be but burial face down. That is that is not that is not what you do 
for a person that you care about or respect in this period. Um, that's just, that's a sign. And also being buried on the outskirts of a community and in a community that's being abandoned as well. It's, um, yeah, it says quite a lot. And that's one of the reasons why when people, when we see these articles in publications about vampire burial, I, I don't get, and they, and they, if they find one or they'll, they'll regenerate articles from the past, uh, around about Halloween time, about ooky spooky, and my goodness, if they find one in or around Transylvania, it's game over. But let's, for me, let's just remember that um, I, uh, Scarlett, I have seen the crafting chat, and I quite enjoy um, that you might f <laughs> you might form yourself into a a circle of uh, uh, historical hookers, which I'm assuming relates to. Crochet. I I I assume it relates to relates to crochet. Yeah. There's it's it's you know pe people when people get ooky spooky about when they see in in graveyards cages over the grave, but it, then somebody points out that's about grave robbers. It's about protecting and preserving the interred remains. This is not about that. <sighs> yeah, I mean, that's another, that, Hadrian, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist. I don't know what the normal situation would be i mean if they were a named individual who was buried in a deviant or perhaps disrespectful fashion or in a, in a in a fashion that doesn't seem to fit with how people today think they should be interred you know whether it's the suspected remains of the prince in the tower that were placed on the orders of king charles into west in charles ii into westminster abbey or whether it's the king in the car park, which is the third who gets interred in the cathedral. That is remains that have been removed from their original resting place for a place found to be more fitting. So when you have deviant burial, particularly if that burial requires excavation and removal because of what's going on next, I don't know what happens to those remains. Um, but I am curious. I am curious. Yeah, I mean that is that is the that is thought to be the reason that's why the vampire thing comes out. Uh but yeah. So when we do see those news items about vampires and things coming out in the next few weeks, um questions. <laughs> questions about that. A shop allegedly once owned by Anne Boleyn's father, I don't think he ever worked there, so don't get excited, uh, is for sale. This is a shop that's claimed to be the oldest in the country. This is the Tulip Tree in Kent, dating back to 1453. It's now got a post office, a tea room and a general store, and it's being put on the market for £230,000. That's a steal, actually. And... She said the next owner has got to be someone who really wants to take it on as a lifestyle choice. It's not just a shop, it's a community. She's, the current owner said that she loved serving the village during the pandemic and was really able to look after the community. As we know, the Berlin family influential during the Tudor period and the she wonders if Henry VIII might have dropped into the shop to visit the Berlins. They, they may have owned the shop. I don't think that... that Thomas and Elizabeth had a penny on selling groceries. I think that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. Um, this Amberlyn's father built them bought the manor house, the overall building that the shop is part of in the 16th century. This is a Grade One listed building that has been used in acclaimed films such as *A Room with a View* by Helen the Bonham Carter. I mean, it's it's good value for the for the property 
It ain't money I've got. <laughs> it's new, 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 new. Um, but for somebody, lovely for them. Lovely for them. Talking about the deviant remains, that's my concern is that that is possibly what happens uh, for a non-named individual. Uh, I yeah, I mean it's possibly also because of the fact that it's a shop and a post office, and it can't ever be changed. That also could be. That I I saw a um, beautiful 16th century Grade Two listed building thatched down in Dorset, and I mean Dorset is cheaper than London, but it's it was it was on for fairly fairly cheap, and I think there's an element to which the the listing is being grade one or grade two listed does for some people diminish the price because it does come with a lot of responsibility rightly so rightly so this one's weird the van gogh that we talked about being stolen recently so during the pandemic it was stolen from a small dutch museum in 2020 has already been recovered which is uh which is lovely this is the Spring Garden, and it's back with the Groninger Museum three and a half years after the theft. This is a painting from 1884, and it was stolen from the Museum Singer Lauren, east of Amsterdam. It was on loan there as part of an exhibition, and the theft took place during the weeks-long lockdown. Dutch police released security footage showing the moment that thieves broke in, and st they, they broke a glass door and stole the painting. The painting was found in an ikea bag apparently the painting has suffered we're told but at first sight it is in good shape police have been closely involved in all phases on recovering this painting and the museum can't currently comment on the ongoing inquiry uh, the museum did say that arthur brand who is a prominent dutch art detective did play a key role in the whole process and i do wonder if it's a case that the theft of the painting got more publicity than they expected and the painting became too hot to handle and certainly too hot to sell on. A set of daguerreotypes, which I think is how you pronounce it, daguerreotypes, that are linked to a notorious British naval disaster raked in more than $500,000 at Sotheby's. These photographs had not been seen for 178 years. This is a collection of photos, photographs of Sir John Franklis, Franklin and his senior officers who were on the doomed exploration ship, the HMS Erebus and Terror. They were sold in London. I mean, don't call a ship the Terror. That's a bad sign. They were sold in London, yes, not yesterday compared to this article, for £444,500, which is more than double the two, the highest estimate they had, which was £200,000. They were as part of an auction entitled Travel Atlases, Maps and Photographs. This is apparently the highest ever price paid for daguerreotypes. Um, although it's among the highest, although there was an all-time high of 920, 922, what? No, $9,222,888 that was paid 20 years. The commas were in a weird place there. <laughs> it was paid 20 years ago for by a work by a French photographer called the Temple of Jupiter, Athens. That sold in 2003. Sotheby called these daguerreotypes, these ones, the most significant artefacts for the history of photography and polar exploration rediscovered in recent times. These photographs were originally commissioned by Lady Jane Franklin, the wife of the British Navy officer Franklin. They were taken by the Richard Beard Studio on Regent Street in May 1845, 
aboard the HMS Erebus just three days before it set sail on a journey from which it never returned. The Erebus and Terror were lost. All 129 men on board died, and it's one of the worst disasters in the history of British polar exploration. These daguerreotypes were produced when photography was still in its infancy. British authorities invited Franklin, who was 59 at the time, as expedition commander, alongside James Fitzjames as commander of the HMS Erebus and Francis Crozier as commander of the HMS Terror. All three men feature in the daguerreotype set and are shown posing in their uniforms with 11 senior members of the crew of the Erebus. A Florida museum has fired a CD curator for organising a show that possibly contained looted Greek antiquities. The Denver Art Museum has also cancelled plans to host the show in question. So a curator is out of a job at Florida's Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg because concerns were raised about the provenance of Greek antiquities that he had included in a high-profile exhibition. This show was called From Chaos to Order, Greek Geometric Art from Sol, the Sol Rabin Collection. And it was going to travel to the Denver Art Museum, but this was later cancelled uh, because prov- the provenance controversy began to grow. The Denver Museum suggested p- postponing the exhibition to give more time to investigate the provenance of the works. But after two months, the Museum of Fine Arts put its curator, Michael Bennett, on leave and then they fired him a month later. How the role of the potential illicit origins of the works in the show played in this decision to terminate the curator remain unclear. He was a senior creator of early Western art and he told the, the New York Times that the museum never explained its reasoning for termination. The museum's lawyer told Bennett's counsel in a letter that's been obtained by the Times that his employment was at will but uh, quote, if cause were required to terminate Dr. Bennett's employment, MFA would have more than sufficient grounds to do so, as Dr. Bennett well knows. So that sounds to me like a threat, like keep pushing this and we'll make it so that you can never work again because it's going to be so embarrassing. So we'll see how this plays out. Meanwhile, a 1.5 million ancient Buddha statue has been stolen from a LA art gallery. It's been caught on security camera. This bronze sculpture was stolen on the 18th of September from the Baccarat Gallery in Beverly Grove. This happened at about 3.45 a.m. their time. This sculpture weighs about 250 pounds and it dates back to Japan's Edo period. And according to gallery owners, and it's believed to have been commissioned as a centrepiece for a temple. The gallery owner says they prize it so much This is where it gets a bit weird. I had it in the backyard of my home. Okay, Fayez Baccarat. And when I moved into this gallery, I put it in the backyard of the gallery for everyone to admire and enjoy. Security videos show the thief pulling up to the gallery in a moving truck. The driver then steps out, breaks open a driveway gate, enters the gallery, and then uses a dolly to move the statue into the truck. The height took around 25 minutes, the owner said. Uh, Baccarat said he acquired the statue more than 55 years ago and that there is no other piece in the world quite like it. We have 200 objects back there, but this is our prized piece, said Paul Henderson, the gallery's director. I don't like the way they're talking about this. I don't think there's another like it on the market anywhere on the market that's not museum language is it that's not i mean i suppose art galleries sell things i always think of an art gallery like the national portrait gallery as a museum but i suppose they aren't are they they are warehouses and sales rooms and i think that's what's going on here um right it's four feet tall hollow cast bronze a stunning piece aesthetically arresting and it's shocking to see something like this go missing. The Baccarat believes the theft was premeditated. I would, if you turn up with a removals van, babe, I'm going to go with don't change careers to be a detective because you are stating 
the obvious. Uh, also, my question. If there's no other piece like it on the market, why have you kept it? Dans le jardin. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in the 12 years that Henderson has worked at the gallery, he has never once experienced a burglary. Okay. Well, it only takes once, doesn't it, babe? He also said it would be quite difficult to sell the unique piece without getting caught. Um, did you plan to sell the unique piece, though? Because you're talking about it being on the market. <sighs> I suppose, yeah, yeah. LA is it's not it's not London, is it? <laughs> where it where it the other day it just randomly started hailing, and uh, I talked about my son again. He was looking at the window and he just started saying the word salad, and we were very confused as to why he was calling hailstone salad, and that he was calling it a frozen salad. And then we finally, my husband finally twigged that he was mispronouncing the word solid as salad. <laughs> so it was a, he meant frozen solid, but he was saying frozen salad. It, well, what it's certainly giving is somebody has been there and cased that joint and knows also how easy it's going to be to break in at three in the morning. Like turn up with this, snip it in, let's go. Like that's someone who knows how flimsy the back gate protection is and what you would need to open it up. I wouldn't have thought so either. And I and I doubt it was intended to when it was originally created. I have I have big doubts that it was intended to be placed outside. And by big doubts, I know it wasn't. So Right. So galleries display art for sale. So that's the thing, because over here we have we have art galleries and that and that's I suppose we do also have art galleries that sell art, but we have art galleries and that's an um we I would predominantly go that's a museum for art. But that is not what it means all around the world, and I need to Remember that. Um, the ding dong bell. Ding dong bell. It's time. We talked about this hero. I use that term and don't mean it even remotely. Uh, and I didn't want to put it in the updates because I feel like he deserves to live in the ding dong realm, even though this is an update. So this... <sighs> Clever, clever, clogsy. Uh, the person who went as a party goer and stole a finger from one of the terracotta warriors, who is now 29 years old. This is a six year saga, uh, and he was a drunken act of vandalism. So he was still well into his 20s when he decided to snap the finger off of a terracotta warrior. And what he's been given, in addition to probation, the judge, Kenny, ordered Rahana to pay a $5,000 fine, complete 100 hours of community service and pay restitution. That restitution is to be determined later to the Franklin Institute, its insurer, and also to the museum which the ancient Chinese statues had been on loan from. We are told it could have been worse. Kenny's decision to spare him prison Le in prison time has left unresolved for now how much money he's going to have to pay for his crimes this is in addition to the £25,000 cost of $25,000 cost sorry of repairing the statue the institute is seeking reimbursement for more than $50,000 that was spent on installing security barriers and was also spent to fly Chinese officials to Philadelphia to examine the damaged statue some of that cost may be covered by a $32,000 collection of Air Jordans and other Nike sneakers that Rohana told the judge he'd been collecting for years. The judge, Kenny, set a hearing next month to determine the full restitution amount, sending Rohana off on Wednesday with a hint of the financial penalties to come. Quote, it's going to hurt, the judge said. So when we have news about how much he's being given to pay, oof. That's gonna be that's gonna be spicy. 
don't break things in galleries. This one was, I should have talked about earlier. And I was reminded of this. This is Shay D. So the Crooked House pub in Himley has burnt to the ground because of arson. And a 66-year-old man from Dudley and a 33-year-old man from Milton Keynes have been arrested on suspicion. This pub is a wonky pub, so it's on the wonk, or it was rather, it was in the black country and it burnt down on the 5th of August. Uh, this is just a week after it was sold to new owners. And after it burnt down, it was then demolished with a quickness. Because as you can see here, this is this is a fire damaged building, but the walls are still up. There, It would have been much easier to rebuild from this point, but no, it was then demolished. Uh, 22,000 people have joined a Facebook group calling for the pub to be rebuilt brick by brick. People have camped outside. There has been violence in the encampment. This building dates back to 1765. and It slopes at a 60 degree angle because of subsidence in the area. And that's because of it being a mining. The Black Country is, you know, a, a mine area. It This was sold by the Brewer Marstons on the 27th of July. The building was then completely demolished on the 7th of August, with South Staffordshire Council later saying it had, quote, not agreed to the demolition of the whole structure, only to some sections being removed for safety reason. And they are now going to be investigating planning breaches. Marco Longhi, Conservative MP for Dudley North, said that he would be pushing for a, quote, crooked house law to better protect historic pubs and buildings, while West, West Midlands Mayor Andy, Andy Street said that he was laser-focused on getting the building rebuilt brick by brick. South Staffordshire Council later confirmed it had reached an agreement with the new owners, ATE Farms, that all the bricks would remain on site and the building's foundations and slabs would remain to assist investigations. A spokesman for the police said, we continue to appeal to anyone with any information which could help us to get in touch. So you can call or you can call Crime Stoppers. Um, I don't think it's necessarily an insurance fraud. I, I think what's being intimated is that the new owners wanted the pub out of the way. This crooked pub, they wanted it out of the way. And they were prepared to do crimes or somebody connected to them allegedly was looking to do crimes. That is the allegation. Obviously, it doesn't seem like the new owners are the people that have been arrested for the arson. So the question is, did somebody pay the arsonist or was this just a weird coinky dink that like a week after this, these new owners buy it, suddenly it burns to the ground? Are they? Yeah, is it looking? Are they looking to redevelop it? Oh, it's definitely not an accident. It's definitely arson. Uh, the question is, can they pin it on some on a group uh, more nefarious than just two arsonists being fools? Uh, but I have to say, allegedly, because to my knowledge, the developers, sorry, the new owners slash future developers, whatever, there has been no indication that they have been charged uh, at all. The building was beautiful and it was, you know, the Black Country Museum is a really important living history space that I'm desperate to go up and film at. It looks really cool. And this Black Country pub, it's part of this wider history uh, and story of of my country as a, as a place where vast swathes of it were integral to mining uh, and those mines were closed and those just like the docks in the east london the mines were closed the docks were closed and entire communities were pushed out of locations and out of work because of it so here's the thing Weatherspoons, there's a lot wrong with Weatherspoons, but when they get hold of a heritage building, 
they are among the best. Like they put up glass walls, they use the original features. So like some of the Weatherspoons pubs that are in historic events. I mean, I'm currently boycotting Weatherspoons, but what I will say is when it comes to preservation of buildings, to my knowledge, they do uh some good some good stuff, some really good stuff with preservations. The it's called the Black Country Museum or the Black Country Living History Museum. Uh, and it looks incredible. They have like this town where you can kind of go into the chemist shop and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I mean, if if they were involved, they're not smart, which which I I I I think maybe maybe they aren't involved. Hopefully we'll find out and the proper people will be punished and they will, in fact, rebuild this on the wonk, brick by brick. Sticking with ding dongs, there's a few. A tourist broke a statue in Brussels, this historic statue, one day after it was unveiled to the public, after it had been uh, subject to a three year restoration project that could cost more than $18,000. Because a tourist climbed onto this statue in Brussels in Belgium on Sunday and accidentally broke off a portion of it. If you want to go climbing, go to a climbing wall. There's you your urban explorers stop, desist at once. No, thank you. A man in a white shirt and a pair of black shorts was shown in this video trying to get down from the statue. The man is from Ireland. And later in the video, a piece of the statue, which the man was shown holding. <sighs> Give me strength. Broke off and fell to the ground. The man was then shown walking away from the statue. This statue, which comprises a lion and the figure of a man with a torch in hand, is part of the Brussels Stock Exchange building. Um, the tourist had broken the statue just a day after it was shown to the public following a three-year restoration project. Uh, yeah, it they they aren't they aren't for climbing. They aren't for climbing. Leave them alone. Don't climb. Don't you know what? Don't climb things, grown-ups or children. In fact, don't climb things because. Either you'll get hurt or or you're gonna hurt something very valuable. I remember the days when they used to have put have to put out PSAs for people when my age, but when I was, you know, of the age to go clubbing a lot, which apparently was 14. I shouldn't have been in nightclubs, but I was. Um, and I used to remember PSAs about not getting drunk and climbing up scaffolding. There were some really horrendous adverts about people falling off of scaffolding because they were three sheets to the wind and then some. So I remember that. Maybe we need something similar <laughs> for statues. Like, don't climb stuff. I don't know what that is referring to. I'm going to check it out. But, yeah. Wild. Wild. Um, we're not done. This is rich people being being ding dongs. Um, you know, I don't think it was somebody looking to topple a statue of a problematic person that's being memorialised. I think it was just here's a high thing. Let me climb the high thing because it's a thing that's there to. So, once again, we are seeing people doing things, broadly speaking, with historical stuff that they have no business doing. This is the Virgin Galactic mission. On it, the bones of Australopithecus Sediba and Homo Lendi have been taken to the edge of space. No one, no one knows why this happened. Alessio Venezania, Venezania, who is a biological anthropologist and co-organiser of the advances in human evolution 
Adaptation and Diversity Conference succinctly identified four main issues that have been discussed in regard to this. The lack of scientific justification for this flight, the ethical issue surrounding the respect for human ancestral remains, Burger's access to the person who took it, Burger's access to the fossils, which few other researchers share, and the misrepresentation of the practice of paleoanthropology. This fossil's space, the fossil space journey has been roundly criticized for lacking a scientific purpose. Why have you taken them to space? especially since a malfunction on the mission could have destroyed these priceless specimens. The person who took them took, uh, had a permit request, which was ultimately approved by the South African Heritage Resources Agency, who mentioned that the goal of the journey was to promote science and bring global recognition to human origins research in South Africa, rather than to address any scientific questions. So you took human remains to space as some kind of mascot? No. Absolutely not. Um, Sonia Zagorowski, who's a bioarchaeologist from the University of Southampton, said that she, that she was horrified they'd been granted a permit, continuing, this is not science. Walsh echoed her concerns with the ethics of the flight, because fossilised bones are not just scientific specimens, they are the remains of our collective ancestors. We owe them respect. For the purpose of a permit, however, the fossils appear to have been characterised as paleontolog paleontological rather than human remains, which gets around the ethical and legal issues. And that thus speaks to larger ongoing scientific discussions as to who or indeed what we consider to be human. <sighs> just I don't know why I don't know why they've done that well that is the end of our ding dongs and now we do have a couple of cool exhibitions that I want to show you as per usual in both of these cases the accessibility information is also linked into my husband's just uh, talked about the space he loves space and with regards to that last story, he said, even as a Trekkie, he is a Trekkie. That is Warp 9 Ding Dongery. I agree. There's no way Spock would approve that. No way. This, as, as I always do, when I am able to find accessibility information for these sites, that is also linked in the description box. And that is the case for both of these. This is an exhibition at a museum in The Hague. And it's entitled Loot. 10 stories. Suppose you're the director of a museum that houses art that was once stolen. How do you deal with it? Should you return it? Do you leave it there? And if you leave it there, are you as a museum complicit in looting? The exhibition Loot 10 Stories shares the struggle museums have with stolen art. Where did the objects come from? Why were they stolen? So there's a VR headset and you then find yourself in a secret art storage in a tunnel, a kilometre underground, and you are eye to eye with a stolen Rembrandt. How did it end up there? This sounds super cool. Uh, if you are going to be in or around The Hague between now and the 7th of January 2024, and you get a chance to experience this, please do let us all know what you think. It sounds absolutely fabulous. And last, but by no means least, we've got news that the Tenement Museum, which has been closed there's been parts of it, all of it's been closed because of a preservation project. The 97 Orchard Street tenement has now begun a phased reopening. And so there are tours, a whole host of tours that you can start to book. And you can learn all about the reopening by going to this website. And there will be all sorts of tours. I will just flag up that usually there is a lift for accessibility. However, Currently, the website is warning that the lift is out of service. So it's, it is it is best to keep abreast of that if you do require accessibility via a lift and make sure that it's reopened and possibly it's worth giving them a call and seeing what the situation is there. Born, you live there born and raised. Well, then, you should be our person on the ground. 
See if you can get see if you can get into this VR headset if you like VR. I know some people get a bit sicky with it, but if you get a chance to put on the VR for loop 10 stories, let us know what you think. That would be cool. Uh and yes, maybe we should maybe we should make this an outreach exhibition and we should get we should bring the VR headsets over to the people in in charge of the British Museum and make them have a little looky loo. So that is what I have for you. And we have been, it's not three hours long. Miracle. <laughs> um, miracle of miracles. So I, I'm just very, very grateful that you've all taken the time to be here for the live stream. Or if you are watching on the playback, thank you so much. Please do make sure that you are subscribed. Make sure that you like this one. Share it with your friends. Thank you for commenting in the live chat. Please also do also comment in the not live chat beneath the video in the comment section. That's also really useful. Helps to boost it through the algorithm. Additionally, do check out my website, www.katrinamarchant.com. If you go over there, you can sign up to my mailing list and in there I do send out a mail shot every depending on what time of day it is for you Wednesday late Thursday morning early in that it will include the early sneaky peek the little short that I put out on a Friday that comes on Wednesday to Thursday depending on what time of the world you were in uh for you it tells you what the video is about and it will also tell you usually if we're doing a live every fortnight it will tell you about that live and it'll give you a link to that and as I said, I am working on a new piece of merch. When I have it to take a picture of, I will be putting that in there too. So it will be the place where you learn things first. And it's also a really great way to get around the fact that sometimes YouTube doesn't like to tell you when I'm doing things. It sounds like additionally, Twitter might be about to start putting everything behind a paywall and I am not paying Space Karen money not doing it so if you do like to share articles with me and you are doing so on twitter i'm incredibly grateful if slash when twitter goes up the wazoo please do send them to my email that is reading the past with dr cat at gmail.com it's linked in my description box and it's also on my link tree and all of my other spaces and places in the meantime i hope that wherever you are in your monday maybe Tuesday, you're having a great day and that your rest of your day will be fabulous. And indeed, that you will have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible for the premiere live chat on Friday. I really hope you're going to enjoy that video. It will be featuring a special guest who I think you're going to be quite excited to see. I certainly hope so. And I know you're going to be very supportive about him joining. With no further ado, I hope that you are going to have a wonderful day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. But for now, do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.